Hello, I'm Dr. Steve Kapetsky, a preventive cardiologist at Mayo Clinic, and this is part two of our uh, lipid therapy and statin intolerance podcast for preventive cardiology. I'd like to reintroduce my colleague, Ms. Alicia Mikow, who's one of our advanced nurse practitioners and very active in our lipid clinic. Welcome back, Alicia. Thank you. Now, before, on the earlier segment, we talked about statin intolerance, what it is, how you define it, uh, how you manage it with the different statins and frequency of, of, of the statin use. And then uh, on this segment, uh, we'd like to talk more about uh, the drugs and uh, some of the side effects and uh, things to, to be aware of and how to discuss with patients. So could you just briefly remind us after statins, what, what's in our armamentarium to treat patients? Thank you. Yes. The you know, medications we tend to use as alternatives or additions to statins include the Zetami, Brizetia, Bembidoic Acid, or Nexlatol, the Repatha, Preluent, other p inhibitors, along with the um, Lecvio or Inclizuran. Inject Those last two are injectables. When you start to give these, what do you tell the patients about the potential side effects? Because they're already very aware of that of the side effect issue, aren't they? Right. This they sure are. So typically, I talk about you know side effects. It's starting just with the ZMI. There can be some you know, GI disturbance, some you know diarrhea, some arthralgias have been noted as well. Um, but typically, not as common with statin medications. But again, there are, there are potentials. Um, sometimes they do have like the nasopharyngitis or upper respiratory symptoms as well with that ZMI. So I think it's always making sure they're being aware of what to watch for going into a new medication. It is with any case it should be. With the bemidolic acid, um, there's they were designed certainly for statin intolerant patients. However, the side effect profile is still pretty um, robust. Is the potentials maybe not the myalgia so much, but there's a, a increasing uric acid levels, which is certainly increasing the risk for gout, um, some you know, abdominal pain or elevated liver enzymes, um, anemia, um, certainly limb limb pain, tendon rupture, you know, muscle spasms. So again, that profile still sounds pretty robust and and not always appealing to patients. Uh, with the PCSK9 inhibitors, such as the Repath or Preluent, um, injection site reaction, of course, is that you're breaking the skin, you're going to have that increased risk for um, a skin reaction, typically pretty benign, it lasts a couple of days, and usually, and I've heard patients say it does get better over time as they get used to the medication. Similar with some you know, sinus congestion, some you know, runny nose can happen as well for a couple of days, but it may you know, improve over time as well. Those two, I typically tell patients that those are usually not a reason and the benefit always the risk of those side effects and I usually tend, you know, think it's reasonable to try continuing those medications if that's the case. But there are people who have myalgias um, and flu-like symptoms from those medications as well. And those are more reason to say quality of life is important. And I definitely recommend discontinuing if those are more significant. With the Inclizuran or Lecvio's injection site reaction, again, is a, is a prevalent um, side effect again, but not as a reason not to quit again. Um, some people do have some arthralgias or, or um, bronchitis type symptoms, but those have been a little, not as um, significant or uh, statistically significant in research studies necessarily, mm -hmm. but certainly they have to list a few as far as the FDA goes. Um, my patients thus far that I've prescribed have not had as many side effects thus far, but again, there's it's more, to, more to come as time goes on. And you mentioned then for a bimbidoic acid tendon rupture, is there any certain patients like the elderly or the ones on fluoroquinolones or something like that that are maybe prior prior tendon problems you stay away from more than others? Oh, definitely. I definitely want to make sure I'm not you know, adding you know fuel to the fire if they already have other underlying issues going on. And then you also mentioned uh, myalgias. And it sounds like really any of these drugs can cause myalgias. And uh, and then how long do you wait in between, you know, the first drug or to add a second or stop and add a second? Uh, you just put it right on top of it or you wait a while or how, how do you manage that? I always will wait a good four-week washout period between medications because these medications can build on your system and need to wash out as well before we have, you know, the, the crossover symptoms could be significant. So I don't want to, I want to make sure that the, the side effects, if they present, are not the result of the previous medication, not the current medication we're trying. Yeah, that's a very good point. The um, And then on some of these drugs, these, you know, every two-week um, injectable PCSK9 inhibitors, what what are we finding out about the adherence to those uh, long term? 
A great question. You know, I think it's, it sounds like a great idea initially. It's not a daily pill, but certainly studies are showing that 65% of patients are still on the medication a year later. And so it's not quite 100%, not, not close to 100% adherence to our, for our patients. For one reason or another, they, they discontinue use. So now getting to the subject of barriers to prescribing, and these are, you know, they're insurance, they're financial, they're some some are medical, but most are not. Can you mm-hmm. kind of just give us the survey of the landscape there? Yes, absolutely. So I think insurance is always a big barrier, which is definitely a frustrator for, I think, both patients and providers. Um, when we have these medications that are available, but either they're cost prohibitive or insurance won't cover them for the patient because they haven't met the quite their criteria based on their insurance coverage, even though if they have disease and things are, are they're higher risk. So that's definitely a frustrating piece of things for, for me anyways, as a provider. Um, I think the patients, you know, it's definitely the barrier from that side of things, trying to get that prior authorization to go through and having the, the team in place to help work through that process and appeal if we need to. Those are definitely the, a big barrier, in my opinion. Um, other things certainly would include um, the cost. Certainly, even if insurance does cover it, is the copay affordable for the patient? Uh, you have many patients, especially the elderly population, if they're if their um, copay is they're on a fixed income with Social Security or their pension plan, and they, or if they have that, um, it's hard to live on a fixed income and have those expensive medications still doable for them. Um, and then, of course, the side effect concerns are always another barrier we have to get through to, to talk through that process. And, and they're fear, they're fearful of trying to have a new medication with potential side effects that could inhibit their, their quality of life. Now, have you found in trying to get uh, through the, you know, navigating the prior authorization process and the reimbursement, have you found any benefit from some of the, uh, you know, the software like um, needymeds.org or, uh, you know, GoodRx, anything, any, you know, phone apps, have any of those been helpful or what, what, do you use any specific software to get the prior authorizations done? I have not personally, no. I think I, with our, um, I've heard of patients have used, to check the GoodRx, some, some people have used that. Um, there's another one um, Mark Cuban has put out as well. There's a mm-hmm. um website they can go to look for, I forget the name of it though, unfortunately, um, that have been helpful for patients to get cheaper costs and co-pays. Mm-hmm. Um, but th- I'm thankful, thankful we do have the prior authorization team here that has been somewhat helpful in my opinion. They're getting help and get those paperwork at least done for us and have a nursing support that can help with appeals if they need to, we need to appeal, even though it is a cumbersome process and still very frustrating. Mm-hmm. And then what about, uh, does the age of the patient, does a Medicare versus a non-Medicare push you towards one uh, one therapeutic option over the other? Yeah, actually it does. Um, I think the the uh, Repatha Prelovent medications do have copay cards from the drug companies, which have been helpful for commercial insured patients. Um, they tend to offer that as long as insurance has approved something, it helps with that copay uh, out-of-pocket cost, which is great. Sometimes I know the Repatha is about a $5 copay for m- per month, and I believe the Rep- Prelovent has been up to like a $30 copay per month, if I recall, most recent that I looked at. With the Inclisiran, um, there's actually the Medicare patients, since it's billed differently through ins- the medical insurance versus the prescription insurance, so that seems to open up doors more for Medicare patients, and I've had better approval rates from, or I'm sorry, approval from the insurance companies in that regard. Um, I think we're looking at the medical insurance's perspective is a little different as we're looking at mm-hmm. overall healthcare costs, not just prescription costs, so I think they want to avoid that hospitalization or event that would be more costly mm-hmm. for the patient, so that's helpful, I think, in that regard. And these are, to be clear, these newer drugs, these injectables are added on top of the what they're already on, the statins or the zetamib, et cetera. Correct. Preferably, yes. And of course, it's patients who can't tolerate a statin in a fashion or zetamib. These are, I have used as a monotherapy as well. Okay. And then uh, what about your patients that travel, you know, for the, uh, like in Clizaran, where it's every six months eventually, how, where do they get it when they're going south for the winter? It's a great question. Collaborating, hopefully, with their local provider, if they have a provider down you know, there or there are the infusion centers, we can send them to as well um, where they're traveling to. Um, but again, um, navigating that is definitely a challenge. You're right. The, I think I've had a lot of patients who do travel a regular basis for their job. The the you know the the, the repath or preluent, they have more struggles with that too. Having to carry that with them, refrigerated and keeping it you know cold and such is a, a challenge. Yes, there's no perfect answer there. No. So this has been a great discussion. Thank you, Alicia, for going over all that. And um, 
So to summarize, we've talked about uh, earlier about the statin intolerance. Uh, today, we talked more about the side effects of some of the new drugs, how they work, what's their option, when do you give which one. Uh, sounds like you are you you try to keep going. What's they're on if they're on a daily or less than daily statin? You add in azetamide if they can tolerate it as long as there's not too big of a reach to get their lipids down. Add in one of the newer drugs, either the oral or the injectable. Uh, maybe in the elderly patients with Medicare, you're more likely to go to the Enclizeran or Lecvio route with because uh, of the insurance issues. And then um, and then follow them regularly. How often do you follow them? And after these injectables, when do you start to check their lipids? Great question. Typically with Repathoprelewind, I do inj- um, check lipids about two months into the you know the the after the first, they've started injections. And then with the Lecvio, about a three-month mark before that the second injection, I typically will check again and see where they're at. Right before the second injection. Typically, check, yes. Check mm-hmm. them again. Very good. Well, this is very helpful in a, an area that, uh, you know, we're, it, that we're all exposed to. So the final question, do you think that every, you know, nurse practitioner, internist, family practitioner should be giving all of these drugs? I think that'd be really helpful for the patients because there's, I certainly get referrals from primary care and other cardiology providers um, and their specialty areas, neurology, et cetera, mm-hmm. that it delays care. If we have you know, a three month wait to get in to see us and they could have prescribed that for them at the time of their mm-hmm. consult and get them on therapy earlier and it hopefully reduce that risk for any future issues, it would be really helpful. So I know that yeah. the repathoprelument has been authorized for primary care to use. All providers can prescribe it. I think there's still some some barriers yet with the um, Lecfeo at this point with um, cardiology and endocrinology, but hopefully that will be lifted in, in the near future. Mm-hmm. Well, I couldn't agree more. I think it's great that every uh, every internist, family practitioner, nurse practitioner should be given these drugs. Mm-hmm. Uh, they certainly can. Yes. So, Miss Alicia Mikow, it's been great speaking with you again. Thank you for giving us a great uh, synopsis of the uh, the state of the art of lipid therapy and beyond lipid uh, statin uh, therapy, and uh, some of the effects and side effects and benefits and the hurdles we need to navigate for reimbursement. So thank you all out there that are listening, and we look forward to next time, our next Preventive Cardiology podcast. Bye-bye.